Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to this public meeting of the New York City Rent Guidelines Board. This is just one meeting in a series of public meetings and hearings to determine renewal lease adjustments for rent stabilized housing units in New York City with leases commencing or being renewed on or after October 1, 2018 and on or before September 30th, 2019. I will now take roll call. Please respond if present. Hillary Botine. Present. Rodrigo Camarena. Present. Shayla Garcia. Present. Leah Goodridge. Present. Cecilia Yehosa. Present. Angela Pinsky is not yet here. David Reese. Present. Scott Walsh is absent. And Kathleen Roberts, present. Let the record show that we have a quorum. The next meeting of this board will be a public hearing. Five public uh, hearings to comment on the proposed guidelines will be held on the following dates, times, and locations. Uh, Thursday, June 7th, a public hearing with public testimony at Jamaica Performing Arts Center Auditorium, 153-10 Jamaica Avenue, Jamaica, New York, 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. with interpretation available in Spanish. Monday, June 11th, 2018, public hearing with public testimony at the Main Theater of Hostess Community College at CUNY, 450 Grand Concourse, Bronx, New York, 5 p.m. to 8 p.m., interpretation and simultaneous translation available in Spanish. Wednesday, June 13th, 2018, public hearing with public testimony at St. Francis College Founders Hall, 180 Remsen Street in Brooklyn, New York, 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. with interpretation available in Spanish. Tuesday, June 19th, 2018, public hearing with public testimony the Great Hall at Cooper Union, 77th Street, at the corner of 3rd Avenue in the basement, New York, New York, 4 p.m. to 8 p.m., interpretation available in Spanish and Mandarin. Uh, and uh, then Thursday, June 21st, public hearing with public testimony <coughs> at the Oberia D. Dempsey Multi-Service Center Auditorium, 127 West 127th Street, New York, 5 p.m. to 8 p.m., interpretation available in Spanish. Uh, this is, um, I, I th aren't all of these wheelchair yes. accessible? Yeah. All, all of the hearing locations are wheelchair accessible. Directions to these hearings can be found on our website, nyc.gov slash RGB. Pre-registration to speak at these hearings has begun. You can sign up by calling the Rent Guidelines Board offices at 212-669-7480, then press zero to register. For further information, see our website. And as always, there are copies of our meeting schedule here today. The final vote will take place on June 26th, starting at 7 p.m. It will be held um, at the Great Hall at uh, Cooper Union. Uh, in your folder, you will find copies of the 2018 Housing Supply Report and changes to the rent stabilized housing stock in New York City in 2017, both of which will be presented this morning. Copies of the reports are here today and they will be posted on our website after the meeting. Uh, also in your folder is a memo that was sent to members prior to this meeting as well as submissions received from owners, tenants, and public officials commenting on the proposed guidelines. I will now introduce Danielle who will be presenting the 2018 housing supply report. Again, please note there are copies of this report here today and it will be made available on our website after the meeting. You don't look like Danielle. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Send this down to uh, the tenant folks. Thanks. Okay, sorry about that. Little technical difficulties. The Rent Stabilization Law requires the Rent Guidelines Board to consider the overall supply of housing accommodations and overall vacancy rates. 
Therefore, our research staff produces an annual housing supply report which highlights year-to-year -year changes and trends in the supply of residential housing in New York City with a focus on findings from the 2017 Housing and Vacancy Survey, new construction and demolition data, conversions and subdivisions, cooperative and condominium activity, housing rehabilitation, and government housing programs and funding. The major findings of this year's housing supply report are 22,131 building permits were issued in 2017 for housing units, an increase of 36.0%. The number of new housing units completed in 2017 rose to 25,839, an 11.1% increase over the prior year. City-sponsored residential construction will add or preserve 24,293 affordable housing units to the residential stock, 68% of which are preservation projects. Demolitions decreased 6.9% to 1,722 in 2017, and there was a 3.6% decrease in the number of units in co-op or condo plans approved in 2017 to 8,358 units, while the number of approved plans fell by 1.1%. The number of units constructed with 421A certificates increased by 363.0% to 20,804. The number of units newly receiving J-51 abatements or exemptions decreased by 33.3% to 22,877. In addition, 11.5% of all rental housing is considered overcrowded, and the citywide vacancy rate was 3.63% in 2017. Preliminary findings from the 2017 Housing and Vacancy Survey, the triennial survey of the city's housing stock, were released to the public earlier this year. We presented HVS findings in our earlier income and affordability study, and we report on data related to the city's housing stock for this presentation. New York City is unique in that a significant share of its housing is renter occupied. The HVS reports approximately two thirds of the city's housing stock is renter occupied, compared to 37% for the nation as a whole. New York City has almost 2.2 million rental units, and 44% of those are rent stabilized. Citywide, the New York City vacancy rate in 2017 was 3.63%. Vacancy rates also vary by rent regulation status. The HVS found a tight market among pre-war stabilized units with a vacancy rate of 2.40% in 2017. Post-war stabilized units also maintained a low vacancy rate at 1.21% while private non-regulated units were vacant at a 6.07% rate. The HVS reports that overcrowding varies by rent regulation status with the highest rates among the stabilized stock. Overall, 11.5% of all rental housing in New York City is overcrowded. That is, there is more than one person per room on average, and 4.5% is severely overcrowded. That is, there is an average of over 1.5 persons per room. Pre-war stabilized housing is more crowded than the average of all rentals, with 12.9% overcrowded and 5.1% severely overcrowded. While post-war units are overcrowded at a rate of 13.4% and severe overcrowding is at a 6.6% .6 rate. Private, non-regulated housing is less overcrowded at 11.3%, with 4.2% severely overcrowded. As this pie chart illustrates, about two thirds of New York City's occupied housing stock is renter occupied. The largest share is private non-regulated rentals, 43%, followed by pre-war stabilized, 32%, post-war stabilized, 13%, and regulated units at 12%. Rent controlled units were just 1% of the rental housing stock. Examining the number of building permits issued annually helps to determine the amount of new housing planned each year. Permit approvals for new housing units in 2017 increased by 36.0% to 22,131, following a 71% decrease in the prior year. 
In 2017, permits rose in all boroughs except Staten Island, including Queens, which rose by the most proportionally, up 79.8% to 5,104 units. Brooklyn also saw an increase in permits, up 36.1% to 6,130 units, while permits issued in the Bronx rose 34.9% to 5,401 permits. And permits in Manhattan rose by 19.6% to 4,811 units. But permits fell in Staten Island by 24.0% to 685 units. First quarter 2018 permits decreased by 18.5% in comparison to the number of permits issued during the first quarter of 2017, including double-digit decreases in every borough but the Bronx, including Queens down 44.6%, Staten Island down 34.7%, Brooklyn down 17.2%, and Manhattan down 10.8%. But permits did increase in the Bronx during the first quarter of 2018, up 5.1%. Danielle? Um, do, do we ever con um, uh, try to control for change in the population? So if we, if we know the population is growing, like so a certain increase in, in permits might be meaningful in the context of low, low population growth, but in the population, uh, in the context of high population growth, we might be kind of losing ground. Do we ever kind of compare the population growth to, to new permits? No, I can do that for you though. Thank you. Sure. You can see from this graph that residential building permits increased 36.0% in 2017, following a large decrease in 2016. While the city overall had a 36.0% increase in permits to 22,131 citywide, this map shows the number of permits by borough in 2017 and the change from 2016. As already noted, permits rose by double digits in Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx, but fell by double digits in Staten Island. Permit data can also be analyzed more deeply by looking at the reported size of the buildings applying for permits. In 2017, a total of 1,673 buildings received permits, containing a total of 22,131 housing units. Citywide, 28.9% of these buildings were single family, 31.7% were two family, 9.9% were three or four family structures, and 29.5% were buildings with five or more units. As the graph illustrates, almost all building permits in Manhattan were for the largest buildings, while in Staten Island, virtually all permits were for either one or two family buildings. Building size was more evenly distributed in the Bronx and Brooklyn, and to a lesser extent in Queens. Another way of measuring the level of housing creation is to look at the number of housing units actually completed in a given year, which in 2017 increased for the third consecutive year. In 2017, there were 25,839 new housing completions citywide, an 11.1% increase over the prior year. Increases were seen in three of the five boroughs, including Queens, which rose by 46.4%, Brooklyn, which rose by 21.0%, and the Bronx, which rose by 5.5%. Completions were down in Staten Island, falling 45.1%, as well as Manhattan, down 7.4%. New housing is also created by various programs sponsored by the city's Department of Housing Preservation and Development and the Housing Development Corporation through programs like the Multifamily Housing Rehabilitation Loan Program and the Mitchell Lama Preservation Program. These agencies reported 24,293 housing starts in fiscal year 2017, 68% of which were rehabilitations or preservations, and an increase of 2.9% over fiscal year 2016. The 421A program is designed to encourage new construction of multifamily housing. Owners are exempt from paying additional real estate taxes on the increased value of the property due to the new construction. Depending on the iteration of the program, which periodically expires and is then renewed by the New York State Legislature, 
Exemptions last for 10 to 35 years, and rental properties must abide by all re regulations during benefits. Participation has been rather variable in recent years with both significant increases and decreases. Following five consecutive years of decrease, the number of units receiving final certificates of eligibility increased dramatically, rising 363%. A total of 20,804 units were newly issued final 421A exemptions in 2017, with 39.4% of those units in Brooklyn and 35.8% in Manhattan and just 0.2% in Staten Island. Final certificates of eligibility went up in every borough during 2017, increasing by the most in Manhattan, rising 787.7% and 637.8% in the Bronx, 364.0% in Queens, and 206.7% in Brooklyn. Units rose to 32 in Staten Island, up from zero in the previous year. As you can see in this graph, the number of apartment units newly receiving final certification of 421A benefits in 2017 increased dramatically following five consecutive years of decrease. To meet demand in the housing market, office buildings and manufacturing space are sometimes converted into residential housing, or a residential building is subdivided into additional units. A number of SRO building owners have filed to convert their buildings to other uses, such as tourist hotels. In 2017, 92 of these applications were accepted, down 70 applications from the 162 accepted during the prior year. More than 40% of New York City's owner-occupied housing is in the form of co-ops and condos. Construction of new co-ops and condos, which increase the supply of owner-occupied housing, and the conversion of rental housing to co-op or condo status, which reduces the supply of rental housing, have to be accepted by the Attorney General's office. The number of co-op and condo plans filed in 2017 with the Attorney General decreased 1.1%, with a total of 279 plans containing 8,358 units, a 3.6% decrease in units. Danielle, is, that's, that's conversions and new construction? Yes, that's everything, and rehabilitations. Thanks. This follows a decrease of 31.3% in units during 2016. Similar to recent years, a majority of the 2017 plans were for new construction, a total of 228 plans with 6,906 new units. And 764 units in 18 plans were for non-eviction conversions, with the remaining 688 units in 33 rehabilitation plans. Almost two-thirds of plans accepted were located in Brooklyn, with 65% of the share of accepted co-op and condo plans. And by borough, the most units within these plans were located in Manhattan, with 43% of the share of units citywide. As this graph shows, the number of accepted units in co-op and condo plans decreased for the second consecutive year. The blue bar represents the proportion of accepted units that are condos, and the gray bars are accepted co-op units. In 2017, almost all accepted units were condos. Another tax abatement and exemption program available to owners has been the J-51 program. J-51 was designed to encourage rehabilitation of residential units. As with the 421A program, J-51 benefits are available to both rental as well as owner-occupied units. Eligible activities include MCIs, moderate or substantial rehabilitation, and conversion from non-residential use if substantial government assistance is provided. 22,877 units were newly approved for J-51 benefits in 2017, a 33.3% decrease from the prior year. While citywide the number of newly approved J-51 units fell, the number of units newly approved in Manhattan more than doubled, rising 108.3%. Units fell by the most proportionally in the Bronx, falling 51.0%. This chart shows the fluctuation in the number of housing units newly receiving J-51 benefits since 1995. As you can see, levels decreased 33.3% in 2017. 
Another part of the city's housing stock are those buildings that the city has taken title to in the past for non-payment of taxes. The city in recent years has developed new policies to deal with the non-payment of taxes, including anti-abandonment and third-party transfer programs. In the meantime, it continues to divest itself of the buildings it already owns. And since 1994, has reduced the number of vacant and occupied in-rem housing by at least 99.3% leaving a total of just 323 units managed by the city by the end of March 2018, down from a peak of almost 100,000 units in 1986. This is an increase from 125 units at the end of June 2016. The New York City Department of Buildings tracks the number of buildings which are demolished each year, which decreased in 2017 for the second consecutive year falling 6.9% to 1,722 buildings. By borough, Queens had 33.6% of all buildings demolished in 2017, a fall of 11.6%. Brooklyn had a 33.3% share, a fall of 10.7%. Staten Island accounted for 18.6% of the building demolitions, a rise of 36.2%. The Bronx had a 7.9% share, a fall of 2.2%. And Manhattan had the smallest share of buildings demolished, 6.6%, a fall of 36.0%. Danielle, with, with demolitions, do we have any reason to believe that new construction happens where, the, like, do we kind of have a, a sense of what happens with these demolitions? I would assume a lot of them then become new construction, or is that not true? I don't have a way of relating one thing to another. These demolitions are also, um, they're not all residential buildings. So depending what the parcel was zoned for, you can't necessarily demolish a gas station and put up an apartment building. It just depends what the zoning is. Okay. Danielle, do we know if any of these are rent, rent stabilized? We don't even know if they're residential. So we don't have. To. Yeah, we can't. We can't uh, get a breakdown from the Department the of Buildings. See the chart that is bro it's broken down by borough, but it doesn't really keep more yeah. information about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have not been able to get that from the Department of Buildings, but I think it's fairly rare for a rent stabilized building to be demolished. They have to get uh, permission from THCR, so I don't think it's that common. Um, but I can't say 100%. I guess Brian, Brian might have, if a rent stabilized building was demolished, Brian would probably find out about it in the changes report. So in conclusion, the number of building permits increased by 36.0% following a sharp decline of more than 70% in 2016 to 22,131 units. While housing units completed increased by 11.1% to 25,839 units. And the in-rem housing stock increased, rising from 125 units left in the city managed stock to 323. In addition, 3.6% fewer units were approved for co-ops and condos, but 363% more units were certified with 421A tax incentives while 33.3% fewer units were rehabilitated with J51 tax incentives, and demolitions decreased, falling by 6.9%. And the vacancy rate was 3.63%, less than the 5% legal threshold required for the continuation of rent stabilization. Thank you. If there's any questions? Uh, Danielle, I had two questions. I, one is probably somewhere in the report, but do we have um, a chart with the... Uh with the historical, uh, the citywide vacancy rate, is that in the in the back of the chart or? That is not in the report. I Do can, we put that how far back would you want to go? I mean, it would be nice just to see a chart as with where we have data of just what the vacancy rate is from year to year. Um, and, and, and then uh, a second question, the report talks about Airbnb and I'm guessing that we can't say a lot about that, but what, what can we say about Airbnb? What impact could we say that Airbnb has on the rent stabilized stock in particular, other than th what the uh, comptroller's report said. Can we say anything? I can't personally say anything other than those reports. I think, you know, Airbnb would make a different argument. I mean, they've been running television commercials to that effect, that it's good for people, it helps people stay in their homes. Some of the Airbnb rentals are 
from owners. They're keeping the actual unit out of the permanent housing stock and renting it on Airbnb. Others are the tenants themselves who maybe are going on vacation or have somewhere else they can stay. Um, it is not illegal if you're there to rent on Airbnb. So if you have an extra room or you want to sleep in the living room or whatever, you can as a rent stabilized tenant do that. Um, legally, I don't know what the owner would say, but legally you could do that and make extra money, but you should not be renting the unit on Airbnb for less than 30 days. So I think it's a combination of things. I don't think every Airbnb unit is being kept off the market, but a certain number of them are. And, and we have no data about um, rent regulated units being used for Airbnb. We have no, it doesn't, we don't have data to that effect. I don't have specific data for which units are rent regulated or not, no. Thank you. Hi, I had two questions. One, um, <clears throat> the rate of overcrowding. Uh, you said it's 11.5 this year. Do we have a sense of whether that's been flat over the last couple of years or what's the rate of change uh, it, I, Off the top of my head, I only know from last year, it actually went down. It was 12 something the prior year. Um, it went down for, I think, all the categories. Um, I, Andrew's looking for something, he can tell you. Great. And then the second question, the J51 program, I, I, I have theories why, or I would, I have ideas as to why uh, use of it has gone down, but do you, does the data reflect anything as to why people are not rehabilitating buildings? Uh? I, I, don't, I don't know. I wouldn't be able to speculate on that. Are we ready for this? This is exciting. 12.2% uh, was the overcrowding. So it's 11... 11.5. 11 11.5. 11 so it is down. In the year prior? Is there, do we have a historic... Uh, it's, it would be 2000... Um, I, I can go 11. back if you want. That'd be great. Yeah, we can yeah. give you going back. Do you want it for all apartments or just rent stabilized? For rent stabilized and, and all apartments. Okay. D Danielle, if you were to... Uh, this may be an unfair question, but to try to put together everything and we were to try to predict what all of this means for the next couple of years, I mean, do... do, do do we have a sense that the vacancy rate will increase or decrease based on, on all of these figures, or that's just too hard to say? It's hard to say. The population keeps going up, but the building keeps going up too. So it depends just what grows faster. And also if, um, I think it was even in the paper this morning that if the new buildings going up are out of people's price range, then are people not going to move into them? Um, then again, people need places to live. So are they going to, are you going to see the overcrowding go up in a lower price department? Are the prices going to have to drop on these, you know, more luxury apartments? It's hard to say, but there's a lot of uh, construction going on. And I guess it depends on the economy of New York City. If people keep, uh, if the economy stays strong, maybe enough people will move in to fill it. But you know, the vast majority of what's being built is out of n normal people's price range. It, it would be interesting to see a chart where it had a projected population growth and pr projected housing supply growth and just see if that's going to be increasing over, if the gap between the two of them is increasing over time or decreasing over time. And, and, and unfortunately, I think it might be increasing over time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the other part that I think might be interesting to look at is when do these uh, programs or these buildings expire? And like, are we actually keeping up with when they're expiring and what we're building? And it, are they replenishing those? Um, and then like over time, are we actually filling what like people need in the city um, through it? I think it would be an interesting because I actually have no idea how that would look, um, both for J51 and 421A. Um, and I think the other piece to uh, Danielle's point is that it seems like 421A new construction is actually extremely high compared to like even the average rent stabilizing stock. Um, and so I think that that's like another thing to like just be out in the lookout because those are also not permanently affordable um, and so I wonder like if there's some correlation of when things are expiring and the drop we see of rent stabilized housing and are we building at the rate we need to in order to f you know fill in uh, all of those programs um, yeah Br Brian will go over some of that in the changes report he has the units that left for 21a 
in the past year. Right. Um, I did have a question about the, um, if we have any um, analysis of the impact of rent stabilized housing on other stock. Um, and, you know, in at work. Um, it, I d have noticed that we are, as we start organizing project based Section 8, um, HUD tends to set guidelines based on like what the area's um, rents are. And so I started to, we started to have a conversation that they tend to go a little bit over what rent stabilized housing in the area is. What we organize where it's 78% of all the housing. Um, and so I, I, was, I was trying to think of like, what is the impact of like how expensive or affordable rent stabilized housing is um, in an area and the impact on any other rent regulated other regulated housing since it's such a huge portion of the overall housing is actually regulated in some way um, I I could be wrong but I think that the um, are you talk you're talking about like the fair market rents that get set no I'm talking about like um, uh, like HUD project based section eight buildings, uh, HUD sets the rents based on what the area is currently, the asking rent in that area is. And so I wonder the impact that um, increases in rent stabilized housing stock rent actually has on other kind of regulated housing in, in the city. But wouldn't HUD set the rents to the fair market rents? No. Okay, I'd have to, uh, I'm not familiar really with project based section eight, so I would have or to. Or any other housing, like, uh, you know, rent, re regulated housing is not only HUD, and so are there are there other kind of housing um, project uh, programs that like set their rents in some way like this. Um, and like, how, it, how does that, I don't know, how do our decision and the board actually is not only impacting the rent stabilization stock, but also impacting how other pro programs are being uh, registering or setting their rents? Uh, Okay, I'll, I'll see what I can find. That would be great. Thanks. Other questions for Danielle? No. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you. So I think next we're going to hear the changes report from Brian. Okay, just setting up. Okay. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Um, I'll now present the changes report. Rent regulation has been a fixture in New York City's housing market for over seven decades. Although the laws that govern rent regulated housing have been substantially changed and modified over time including most recently with the passage of the Rent Act of 2015. In addition to legislative changes, the existing laws allow for dynamic changes in the regulatory status of a significant portion of the rent regulated housing stock in any given year. Units enter, exit, or change status within the regulatory system. This report is our annual update of changes to the stabilized housing stock in the city. These totals do not represent every unit that has been added or subtracted from the rent stabilized stock, but rather those that have been recorded or registered by various city and state agencies. They represent a floor or minimum count of the actual number of newly regulated and deregulated units in these years. Since newly constructed or substantially rehabilitated units are exempt from rent regulation, Increases to the regulated housing stock are often a result of owners placing these new units under rent stabilization in exchange for tax benefits. Events that lead to the addition of stabilized units include the following. Section 421A and J51, property tax exemption and abatement programs. Articles 11, 14, and 15 of the private housing finance law, PHFL. Mitchell-Lama buyouts lofts that are converted to rent stabilized units, rent control departments that are converted to rent stabilization upon vacancy, as well as other additions. Tax exemption and abatement programs have a significant impact on the inventory of stabilized housing. 
Apartments newly created with the aid of these programs must typically remain rent stabilized for the duration of their benefits. In 2017, 9,376 units were added to the stabilized stock through the 421A program, 91% more than in the prior year. The largest number of units were added in Brooklyn, 5,309, followed by Manhattan with 1,996, Queens with 1,561, the Bronx with 504, and there were six units added on Staten Island. The significant increase in the number of buildings added to the stabilized stock through 421A this past year may be attributable in part to enforcement efforts by several agencies of applicable tax benefit rules, and that includes initial rent stabilization registration requirements. Brian? Um, so when Mitchell-Lama housing leaves Mitchell-Lama and goes into the rent regulated, um, there's no net increase in regulated apartments, right? I mean, if you had a bigger category that included Mitchell-Lama and rent, rent regulated, do we, do, is there some, does anyone track the total number of rent regulated units in the city? Well, we have the housing and vacancy survey in the pre previous report. Uh, there is the number of actual units Which in each category. Every category. That's okay. in the HVS every three years. Okay, okay. Um, and I'm going to talk about Mitchell Lama in, in just a minute. But All right, thanks. Sure. Um, according to HCR, the median legal rent of registered rent stabilized apartments that are currently receiving 421A tax abatements was $3,300, a 1% increase from the prior year. And this year, there were no J51 units newly receiving benefits added to the stabilized stock due to conversion from non-residential to residential. Uh, the same as the prior year. Other additions in 2017 include 233 Mitchell Lama rental units that were able added to the stabilized stock compared to 716 in 2016. Lofts converted to stabilized status added 10 units up from five the prior year. 142 units were decontrolled and became rent stabilized. 62% fewer than the prior year. And as we began doing last year, we obtained the number of additions to the stabilized stock through a tax incentive programs under, his articles, under Articles 11, 14, and 15 of the Private Housing Finance Law, which added a total of 1,283 units. Among these PHFL additions, the vast majority were in Brooklyn with 824 units, followed by Staten Island with 276, and Manhattan with 183 units and there were no units added in Queens or the Bronx. Um, before you go, mm -hmm. if you go back to the slide, you know, we do our special guideline every year, and I often asked, you know, how many this impacts units. So last year there was only 142 units that it impacts. So just to let the board know that special guideline that we vote on, proposed on, it impacted 142 units last year. So just to put it in some sort of perspective. So to sum up all the additions, 11,044 units were added to the stabilized housing stock in 2017, an increase of 61% from the 6,847 units added in 2016. Of these initially registered rent stabilized apartments, the median legal registered rent was $2,685, a decline of 2% from the prior year. Examining the number of stabilized units added by borough in 2017, Brooklyn had the most additions with 6,164 units, followed by Manhattan with 2,250, Queens with 1,591, the Bronx with 757, and Staten Island with 282 units. The breakdown of additions by borough and how they became rent stabilized can be found in more detail in the report in Appendix 2. Now we'll move on to the subtraction of units from rent stabilization. Deregulation of stabilized units occur because of statutory requirements or because of physical changes to residential dwellings. Events that lead to the removal of stabilized units include high rent, high income deregulation, high rent vacancy deregulation, co-op condo conversions, expiration of 421A and J51 benefits, substantial rehabilitation, conversion to commercial or professional status, as well as losses to the housing stock through demolitions, condemnations, and apartment mergers. 
the largest number of subtractions from the stabilized stock were due to high rent vacancy deregulation, which from June 2015 occurred when vacancy, upon vacancy when the legal regulated rent of an apartment reached $2,700 or more and which subsequently increased to a threshold of $2,733.75 $2, effective January 1st of this year. According to HCR rent registration records of those owners who filed, at least 3,517 units were deregulated in 2017 under high rent vacancy deregulation, a quarter fewer than the number deregulated the prior year. Uh, though it represents 53% of all the units removed from stabilization in 2017. By borough, these units were almost half in Manhattan, 49%. A quarter, 25% were in Brooklyn, 20% were in Queens, 5% were in the Bronx, and 1% uh, on Staten Island. This graph shows the minimum number of units that have left the stabilized stock over the past 24 years since state law first permitted deregulation of units with rents above 2,000 upon vacancy in 1994, which increased to 2,500 in 2011, then up to 2,700 in June 2015, and then most recently to 2,733.75 since the beginning of this year. Brian, do, mm -hmm. do we have a sense as to why the graph looks like that? Like, do, I mean, why it goes up in certain years and goes down, or? Um, well, the threshold changed. Uh, that might have an impact. Um, I don't have any specific reason why it might go up or down like that in a given year. I mean, it's due in part to the threshold certainly being changed as it goes up. Um, and how often was the threshold changed? It was, or it goes up every year? Well, now I just, I can go over it again. It went up. Uh, in 1994, it was 2,000. It, dollars. In 2011, it went up to 2500 so a $500 increase. $2,700, it went up 200 more dollars in June of 2015. And then it went up about $34 this past January 1st. So that, that wouldn't really be reflected here. Okay. And, it, and it's based on a one-year guideline. So our, our current guideline is one and a quarter percent. So that you take, it, you increase the 2700 by the when your guideline, so yeah, the the January first increase set by the legislature, but then and and as of the last time they did this, they implemented this idea that the threshold would go up by the guideline on an annual basis. Um, as the graph illustrates, the number of units that left high rent vacancy deregulation peaked in 2009, but it has fallen in six of the last eight years. Cumulatively, from 1994 to 2017, at least 155,664 units were registered with DHCR as being deregulated due to high rent vacancy deregulation. The other type of deregulation that occurs is high rent, high income, where household income exceeds $200,000 for two consecutive years and rent reaches most recently the threshold now 2733.75. High rent, high income deregulation removed 107 units from rent regulation last year, a 27% decline. Breaking it down by borough, 46% were in Manhattan, 30% were in Brooklyn, 19% in Queens, and 6% in the Bronx, and there were none on Staten Island. This graph shows the number of units that left the stabilized housing stock due to high rent, high income deregulation since 1994, when it was first permitted. Over this period, at least 6,346 units have been deregulated due to high rent, high income deregulation. And every year except 2009 and 1994, which was the initial year that high rent, high income deregulation was permitted, the number of units deregulated has been less than 400 units, including this past year when 107 were deregulated. The apartments left rent stabilization for other reasons as well. Co-op condo status conversions, which include both newly converted units as well as stabilized tenants vacating apartments in previously converted buildings, totaled 672 units, 1% more than the prior year. Expiration of 421A benefits resulted in a total of 1,363 units removed from stabilization, 82% more than in the prior year. 
The expiration of J51 benefits resulted in a total of 363 units removed, 21% fewer than the prior year. 211 units were removed from stabilization due to substantial rehabilitation, 2% fewer than the prior year. 24 units were converted to non-residential use compared to 160 the prior year. And other losses to the stabilized housing stock, such as the merger of pre-existing units or demolition, resulted in 400 additional units leaving the stabilized housing stock, 9% fewer than the prior year. Looking at subtractions by borough, 56% of all units leaving stabilization were located in Manhattan. 21% were in Brooklyn, 17% in Queens, 5% in the Bronx, and 1% on Staten Island. The complete breakdown of subtractions by borough and how they were deregulated can be found in the report in Appendix 7. So summing up the subtractions, at least 6,657 units left stabilization in 2017. That was 12% fewer than in the prior year. Looking at the sum of both additions and subtractions to the stabilized housing stock, the study found an estimated net gain of 4,387 units in 2017. The vast majority of additions to the stabilized stock this past year were the result of four 21A tax incentives, representing 85% of the additions. Meanwhile, high rent vacancy deregulation was the largest source of measured subtractions from the stabilized housing stock, accounting for 53% of the total number of subtractions. This table, which is also in your report on page 10, if you're having trouble seeing the slide, shows the total number of additions and subtractions from all the programs in 2017. It includes 11,044 additions to the stock and 6657 units removed from rent stabilization. So taking the difference between additions and subtractions results in an estimated net increase to the stabilized housing stock in 2017 of 4,387 units. Brian, on that, uh, could you go, yeah, so of those 11,000 additions, what percentage are permanent, like uh, don't have a, don't have a, a sunset time and, wh and what percentage of them have a sunset and what roughly would that sunset be? Um, well, 421A is the bulk of them and they have tax benefits that range from, I think it's 10 to 25. Yeah, sounds right. So I don't know what it will be for all of them. We yeah, don't get okay. that information. Okay. Um, so most of them sunset. And uh, I'm not sure about the article 11, 14, and 15 uh, units. They may or may not have sunsets. The Mitchellamas and lofts and don't. And rent control of rent stabilization doesn't. Thank you. Uh, this graph shows the estimated annual change in the total number of rent stabilized units since 2003, the first year the RGB examined the data in an annual report, through the most recent year, 2017. Prior to this year, net losses occurred annually since 2003, with as many as 15,465 lost in 2009. However, in this report, we saw the first net increase in stabilized units, gaining 4,387. Cumulatively, since 2003, the graph shows a net decline of 104,536 rent-stabilized units over the last decade and a half. Going back further, for the period between 1994 and 2017, the RGB has counted 143,446 additions to the stabilized stock and 290,958 subtractions from the stabilized stock, resulting in a net loss of stabilized units of at least 147,512 units over the last 24 years. Thank you. I will now take any questions you may have. Is there a way of getting a, a breakdown? I'm looking at um, Appendix 3, which um, sets out the average and median rent of initially registered rent-stabilized apartments. Um, is there a way of getting a breakout of the number of units at various price points? Um, I mean, what strikes me here is at least the average and median rents are 
for initially registered rent stabilized apartments are dramatically higher than for the rent stabilized stock of the city as a whole. Um, and I'm just curious if there's information that either by unit or somehow that would show the, um, you know, what I would describe as sort of the affordability curve of um, these newly registered rent stabilized units. Uh, the state is from uh, HCR, which um, provides it to us. I'm not sure if they can do anything like that. Um, I mean, we look at affordability. I guess it, it, I guess the HVS may have more data. So they only give you the average and the median. They don't give you the underlying data. No, um, this is provided to us by them. I mean, we have the, the registration information. We get the registration file, but um, in terms of initial, no, we, we get this directly from them. So that's something we don't already have, but might be able to get. We would have to ask HCR. We don't have okay. it. Okay. Which we will do. Okay. Thank you. Other questions for Brian? No. Thank you, Brian. Thank you.